Hello everybody. So today I want to talk about Indy Semiconductor. So what does Indy do? Indy is a maker of chips for electric vehicles and I would argue it mostly focuses on chips for legacy auto. It has some of the newer uh, electric vehicles players like in China but I think it mostly focuses on legacy auto and really it's well well, well um, suited to the, to the mega trend that we're seeing which is um, cars are going electric, we're moving to electric, electric is just better technology, it's 10 times cheaper, lasts 3 to 4 times as long electric to me is, is a near certainty it's a it's a step change to go from gas cars to electric cars just like it was a step change to go from horses to gas cars so they're they're well suited within a major 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 mega trend and of course tesla was the forcing function right it was it was the the wake-up call that all of these legacy automakers uh, got from tesla which is way hey, hate wait you know tesla's taking market share it's like 60 to 70 percent um player of this EV market, this EV market, which is going to be everything, um, perhaps, uh, you know, perhaps by 2035, which is when a lot of uh, nations have said they're going to ban it, right? Whether, whether it's California, whether it's Europe. Um, so anyways, they have to move. These legacy automakers have to move. And for that, they're going to need much more silicon, much more chips, much more systems on chips, um, much many more ASICs. And so uh, to the point that today, right, as we are moving slowly towards electrification, um, we went from 700 per vehicle to to, um, to 1100, right? That's that's in the future. Today is the gas car of today, the electric car of today. You have a ma major, major increase, right? A 70-ish percent increase in, in the amount of silicon in each car. And in the future, it may be even, in, even more than that as we have uh, actual autonomous vehicles and as these vehicles um, be become cars where you know you can play games entertain walk so many different things you're going to be able to do in, in in these smartphone on wheels i mean really the automobile is moving from a, a mode of transportation to kind of a smartphone on wheel um, and you know one one of the things that, that i can say is that this is this is kind of an nvidia strategy to serve this market if you look at the, the nvidia segment the fourth segment of nvidia is all about serving the, these these companies, these, these, uh, helping them with AI and helping them with, with moving towards electrification. Um, but I, I would argue that NVIDIA right now is, is not really focused too much on that. They're focused on their GPUs, they're focused on their data center cells. And a lot of the legacy um, chip makers, they may not be either 100% focused on, on auto. In fact, they have uh, legacy businesses, legacy software, legacy hardware to sell um, to auto and to other companies. And so they may have this kind of innovator's dilemma where they don't, where, where they can't get out of their own way, where they can't disrupt themselves. This is where Indy comes in because Indy is a pure play auto sector chip maker, chip manufacturer, and they are focused only auto, on auto and only on the auto opportunity, which means that when they negotiate with these legacy auto manufacturers, they have the guarantee that Indy will invest heavily in those manufacturing plants and that Indy will, will, will not allocate attention elsewhere, that Indy is laser focused on their needs to compete with a company like Tesla, uh, who does its its own everything, who is fully vertically integrated. These companies are, these, these legacy auto companies are not fully, fully vertically integrated. They need suppliers. And so, there's three major segments that Indy works on. The, the, the first one has to do with the radar system and the autonomous driving assistance systems and uh, autonomous uh, driving itself. So that's the biggest segment, as best as I can tell. This is where most of your acquisitions I've been in, most of the products are in this segment. The second segment, which is much smaller, is the UX, the in-cabin UX and interface and all this display interface. So all about entertainment and 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 trying to provide uh, not only useful comments, but 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 in, in the future, some, some entertainment to the car, to these major dashboard, these major LED displays. And the third one is, is, is electrification. And they have just a few products in that segment. This is clearly the, the smallest segment. But the company has a vision to be a comprehensive provider of silicon chips um, to those legacy car manufacturers. So I just want to go through each segment and talk about what they do. So the first segment is the driver assistance systems and the autonomous vehicle system. You can 
can see they try to provide an entire an entire stack, right? They try to provide everything that's needed for not only uh, the computer, you know, like lane assist, staying in the lane down the road, um, anything that's self-driving, radars, lidars. They try to 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 um, provide all of that, and they they are recently focused on vision. I think what's very interesting is that most of the acquisitions that they've had so far have been on radar and lidar up until recently where it took a turn for the best and they acquired vision and they acquired this company called geo semiconductors which which is all about vision and actually if you listen to the latest conference call of indie which i have you can see that analysts are very excited that they're getting into vision because here's the thing right now I believe, and, and, and I think a lot of the market is starting to, to, to believe and see that over the long run, vision is going to be the way to go for autonomous vehicles. Like right now, radars are still very important and they're still very useful. But I think because the, the leader in the field, Tesla, is moving away from these radars and LIDAR, LIDARs and moving towards vision, I think there's a general understanding as to where the industry is headed that over the long run, vision is going to be more important than LIDAR and, and radar. Why? Because vision is the way that you can acquire the, the most data, right? Vision, as, as as cameras get better, as you can fit more and more pixels on a camera, as you train uh, large models on this data, they get better and, and you can interpret anything you need from the road through vision. So we don't drive with radars, right? We don't have we, we, we don't have a radar when we drive as humans, where we just have eyes. And I think this is where a lot of industry is headed. But that would be a problem if they were into, into vision, right? But Indy is clearly moving away from radars, in my view, and they're moving into vision. They're investing heavily, and, and their, their camera solution with Geo is, is very promising. A lot of the analysts were very, very excited about this, and I am excited about this, because, because I do believe that even though radars are still going to be needed, um, you know, let's say for the next 10 years, eventually where the world is headed is to, towards a full vision system. And the fact that they acquired Geo gives them, I believe, a, a lead in this sector because now they have a full camera solution in addition to the ride radars and lidars. And it, it's it's also important to note that in in all of these training models, like oftentimes the lidar and, and radar can serve as a way to back up what the computer says for vision, right? It, it can serve as a, as a safety layer down the road to this you know this, this future of an aut autonomy and autonomous vehicles. And, and clearly the legacy legacy autos have to invest in this, right? They can't they can't just sit still and not invest in this. And because of Indy, I, be, I, I believe Indy has just a great positioning in, 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 in that space. What's another thing that Indy does? They focus on user experience, right? Cabin user experience. So they are developing these displays. Um, they have CarPlay solutions, infotainment solutions, car computers, LED lightning system. They also have things like Apple Car Key and... Um, that's their second portfolio of product. Actually, if you go on their website, you can see they, they have quite a bit, quite a bit of, of, of products, right? Between between you know automotive automotive wireless charging, integrated dual channel USB delivery system, uh, driver for high power LEDs. They, they they have very specific semis and very specific product that helps the in cabin UX. So that's that's their second segment. First segment is still radars and cameras, right? Second segment is in cabin UX. The third one is electrification and this is this is kind of a smaller segment but that's a segment that we are looking to grow and we are focusing here on things like charging controllers diagnostic solution like onboard computers um, uh, if you, different types of chips this is their more nascent product area but what we can see is that we are trying to be a a all-inclusive provider of chips for next generation vehicles for electric vehicles we are trying to 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 provide these chips for electric vehicles and, and for that their their growth strategy right now is to um, go acquire a lot of companies on the cheap and this is kind of how Broadcom grew, grew. Um, you probably know that that I typically don't like acquisitions but one thing that I've noticed is that in in the semiconductor sector acquisitions seem to work which is very odd because typically when companies grow by acquisition 
um, you know, t typically it's it's a, it's a half a sign that they're gonna fail, right? Typically, um, uh, but but Broadcom, for example, what very successful chip company, they were able to grow both through organic methods and inorganic methods. Uh, and the fact that they cite the Broadcom business model in the conference call, I think, is very interesting. Is they're trying to br to grow a la Broadcom, right, with a mix of both their own product developments and a mix of acquisitions. And one of the things that I want to say here which I listened to a CEO interview talking about that, is that they're able to acquire a lot of these companies on the cheap right now. Because when you see the valuation of Indy, of course, it, it is depressed compared to, compared to its all-time high. But think think about how depressed the valuations are in the private market for a lot of these innovative companies in the electric uh, sector, right? In the, in the electric car sector. Valuations are very, very depressed right now. And actually, I can't remember the cost they paid for GeoVision, but to me, it seemed very, very cheap what they were able to get it for uh, compared to the size of that company. So in the, because it, it because it did a SPAC at the right time, at the peak of the market, it is now, I think, in a position, in, in a superior position with, when it, where it can acquire a lot of these tiny OEM providers, a lot of these players located across the world. It can acquire them on the cheap, and I think this this is kind of a big deal. This is the way how Broadcom grew to the giant that it is today, and the fact that they cite this, I think, is very promising. Another thing that I want to say is uh, listening to, to uh, the CEO interviews, uh, a few of them that I found, um, selling to legacy auto is kind of a legacy sales process. It is very complicated. It takes years to just be approved as a supplier. When you sell to a lot of these old brands like Volkswagen, BMW, like a lot of German manufacturers, it takes it takes a long while to even be approved to sell. I think that gives them some sort of a moat. Um, and and you know, selling in the semiconductor space, based on my, the best of my understanding, is it's it's all about the relationships. I mean, I mean, relationships matter in a lot of business, but when it comes to the semi space, it's so important. And when I look at the management team, I can see that they have people from all across the spectrum of the semiconductor space, including including Broadcom, right? Engineering, the executive vice president in engineering and and also in sales come from, from Broadcom. Broadcom, I think, is a, is a great example to, to follow. And they have, you know, a lot of leading uh, chip make people, people who have had experience at a lot of leading chip makers. That means that they come in to Indy with the relationships, with something that helps them establish sales, right? Even even ARM for marketing and some major companies. So all, of, all of these, uh, the, the leadership team is really rooted within that semiconductor industry. And, and I think this is a major selling point because like the CEO says, if it takes you three years to get approved just as a supplier with one of the legacy automakers or with one of the tier one OEMs, if it takes you years to get approved as that, it's very hard to imagine another company going in, not going through this whole um, negotiation, you, you know, kind of a, a friendship building with a company to, until you get to the point of, yes, you're listed as a supplier supplier and now you're an option for them. It's a very long sales cycle process, but also, you know, when they make the sale, I think that provides us with, with, with a lot of certainty regarding like once a car adopts one of their products and that car is going to have a run for, I don't know, five years, 10 years some for some models, when that car is going to have a run, you can know that that, that, that chip is going to stay within that car for a long time. So so even though even though it's a longer sales process, um, I think I, I think it, it creates some sort of a moat, some sort of a barrier to entry to someone else. Anyways, let me move on to the financials because these companies' products are interesting, but I think the financials are more interesting when it comes to uh, indie. So first of all, you know that I love revenue growth. And when I look at the revenue growth of Indy, it has accelerated. From 2020 to 2021, they had 114% year-over-year revenue growth. From 2021 to 2022, 129% year-over-year revenue growth. Look at that gross margin. The gross margin is trending up. Gross margin is getting very high here at 50%. It's like best-in-class margins when you get into the semiconductor sector. Actually, I was listening to the CEO talking about they want to get up to 60% gross margin. So that's really high. That's 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 among the best margins you can get as a fabulous chip manufacturer. 
And although, although I, I, I could go through my own calculation and, and come up with my own numbers for their growth next year, um, I'm not going to because the analysts are predicting for the next 12 months, they are predicting 102.5%. So that's the analysts saying that, and you know, analysts have been have been very very bearish right now. They've provided sandbagged guidance from so many different companies. So so I'm sure if I were to peel back the onion and actually make a prediction for what growth is going to be for Indy, I would come up with higher than 102 percent. But they're expecting a deceleration. Um, 102 percent is absolutely outstanding. It's actually the highest expected growth by analysts in my entire coverage universe. So this company is right at the heart of the auto disruption trend. They are lying at the heart as one of the suppliers to the legacy auto. It's I think it's a way to get an exposure to non-Tesla sales of electric vehicles without having to buy one of the EV makers actually, like 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 a Ford or a Volkswagen, without having to bet on a successful turnaround. So that provides a, a margin of safety, I, I, I think. Um, when it comes to competition, they have a lot of competition, a lot of tiny players. A lot of tiny players compete against them. Uh, legacy OEMs, I believe, are less of competitors. But in my view, that competition is 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 not. I mean, it's not too big of a threat because it's such a huge market. It's going to be such a huge market, and also the competition is 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 getting diluted as companies like Indy and, and their competitors also acquire different firms and consolidate into fewer firms. Uh, the concentration is fine. It's mostly automobile, mostly legacy auto. But uh, I mean, there's a little bit of, if there's a little bit of risk, of course, because because I, I do believe that some of these auto companies are going to get into trouble. But the, the better question to ask when, when you say, for example, oh, I don't want to invest in Indy because I don't think Indy, I, I don't think GM is going to make it or I don't think Volkswagen is going to make it. And so that could be a reason not to invest in Indy. And uh, from, from, a, from, from a standpoint of a shareholder, say in Volkswagen, which could get wiped out. Um, you know, I would I would argue yes, stay away. From, I mean, I want to stay away from any stock like Volkswagen or Ford or GM. I want to stay away from that. But I think a better question from from for Indy to ask is, are these legacy makers of cars are they going to ba get bailed out by their respective government? And I believe so. I, I have no indication, I have no reason to believe that these legacy makers of cars will not be helped by their governments so that they survive. In which case, a business like Indy is safe in its business because it's going to be able to keep supplying the products to these legacy auto companies who, in my view, will likely get bailed out. Let me move on. Um, uh, the, the, the strong customer relationships and the high switching costs, I believe, provide some sort of, of a moat, even though it's not recurring revenue, it's revenue that is uh, directly linked to the sales of legacy auto. Right, so it, it kind of gives you a, a build. Like if you invest in Tesla, this company almost gives you a, a, a hedge, a hedge against yourself, a hedge against one's bullishness on Tesla, for example. And and, and I like that. I like the idea that this gives you a hedge. Macro sensitivity, I believe, is in is low. In my view, electric vehicles are going to get adopted because they are of a superior technology. And you know, when your car breaks down and you need a new car. You don't you don't predict when it breaks down and you need a new car. So 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 to me that is fairly low macro sensitivity. Now let me talk about the growth runway. The growth runway is very high. Their total addressable market, or what they call their served addressable market, um, is growing, which is great to see. It, it, it's growing, and and you know by by 2030 this will likely be a double of what it is today. By 2030, it's growing in all three of their segments, and not only is it growing at a fast Rate right, thirteen percent, right, thirteen percent. You're gonna you're gonna get a doubling in six years, roughly. Always growing at a fast rate. I think what's more important is they only capture about zero point four percent right now with their revenue. Zero point four percent of that total addressable market. So huge total addressable market. I think this is very bullish for Indy. Now they've been growing by acquisition. I put this uh, I put this as a, as a as kind of an orange flag. It's kind of a medium flag. I don't like growth by acquisition as a general rule. I think it can be very dangerous. A lot of companies can overpay. However, I'm willing to make an exception for the semi sector because in the semi space, acquisitions seem to work. And, and and I guess I guess I don't know why, but it's it's very interesting that, that in that space that works and that works very well. Let me talk about SGNA. 
So there is GNA. Uh, I love to see that there are on the expenses are there and re remain high because you need to always develop new products. This is a high growth company, uh, and their general and administration expenses are high too because of the acquisitions. But when when you look at the data as a share of revenue, this is trending down as a share of revenue. I don't have it on, in a chart here, but as a share of revenue, SGNA is is going down, which is what you like to see when you look at SGNA as a share of revenue. All right, let me move on. So what matters a lot when you invest in companies in the way I invest, which is I invest for growth and growth first and foremost growth. I care about cash flow. I don't want the company to go bankrupt. That's the main risk when you invest with companies that don't have uh, gap earnings, right? Is, is they could go bankrupt. Um, well, when I look at when I look at their at their numbers, I see that uh, they had a, tw um, a negative twenty two million cash flow over the last trailing trailing twelve months. So negative twenty two million that gives them about six plus years of run of cash runway from the best of my ability of what, what I can tell. And I, I believe I believe that's more than fine because they're growing revenue at more than one hundred percent. Analysts are predicting a doubling of their revenue. So so that that negative cash flow, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this company becomes cash flow positive sometime this year and they have more than enough cash to cover that, that negative cash flow actually let me cover the, the, the debt and, and cash right now this is the net cash position um, actually that's more like 12 years if you just look at cash and overlook the debt right they have some debt but they have so much more cash so I'm not going to ding them on debt because they have they have almost twice almost twice as much cash, cash as they have debt um, now What's amazing is the gross profit. As I've said before, the gross profit is 50%. CEO wants it, wants to get it near to 60%. And that gross margin is very high for the space. It's actually in line with AMD, which is which is stunning. For a company this, this, this tiny, for a company this size, is, is stunning. This is a company that's well optimized for gross margin, which is very impressive for a company that young. It is run by a lot of industry veterans, from what I can see. Now, what about the dilution? Now, from what from what I see, they've been able to buy back some shares and and and, and uh, remove some of the dilution that have happened because of acquisitions. However, uh, we're going to have some dilution for a company that grows this fast and that goes by by acquisition. The question is: Is the dilution uh, accretive? Are these acquisitions accretive? And in the case of Indy, I, I believe I believe it is. And when you look when you look at the trend, yes, yes, there is some dilution. But keep in mind that that, dil that dilution is 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 you're not getting diluted for the same business, right? You're getting diluted for a bigger business. And if that helps them preserve cash, if that helps them be uh, more anti-fragile, I don't have a problem with dilution. The classic example I use with dilution is, is you know, Tesla. If you, if you bought Tesla in the, in the early 2011, 2012, you got diluted four times. You, you, your shares got diluted 400%. And, 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 you know, Tesla did wonderful. Sometimes dilution is not always a bad thing. If dilution is, is going to help a firm acquire more companies, it's, if it's going to, to help the firm avoid bankruptcy, because when you do stock-based compensation, you don't lose your cash. And cash is king right now in the current debt environment. I believe dilution is not always a bad thing, but I know some people absolutely hate dilution. They can't stand it, and, and that's okay to each their own. Insider ownership, that's pretty high at 14.3%. And the company is founder-led. In fact, the company has three founders, um, actually four founders, and those four founders are all on the management team. That, that, that's those who are circled here. They are all founders of the company. And their revenue per employee um, is actually fairly high for a company that's growing this fast, right? You would expect it to be a little lo lower. This is a productive company. I, I think the employees are, are, are being effective here. Um, uh, not a lot of slack, right? To me, in my view, it's a productive company. Each company likely earns more than their salary uh, in this in this company. And and let me finish with uh, the stock price. So actually, if you look at the pattern of, of Indy, and if you're familiar with, with the Hims him, with Hims stock, you'll find that the stock price fo follow this kind of U shape where oh it totally sold off right 2022 because all SPAC was bad, right? So it got caught in the macro storm. And then investors mid-2022 started realizing, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe maybe we shouldn't have sold that one. Maybe that one is not like the other. Uh, and, you know, that's why investors, I think, are starting to notice that Indy is not like the others. And it's a pattern that I found in Hims too, which is I really like Indy right now. I'm, I'm really liking, and, and, and I think I will be starting a, a, a 
a position soon in Indy. In fact, I've already added it to my spreadsheet. Um, keep, keep in mind that, that the semi space is a space that usually sees sees high valuations because it's a, it's a very high potential space. You know, it's a it's it usually sees fairly high valuation when if you look at Nvidia, but even AMD. AMD is not cheap. Even AMD is not not. Too, it was cheap like two months ago, but it's not as cheap as it used to be. Um, and when I see that valuation for a company like Indy, you, you're getting into you're getting into my my top five cheapest stocks in my universe right now with, with that valuation when I run the numbers. And so imagine when the gross margin is going to be say say I don't know 58% 59% and what if they actually uh, are able to sustain another 100% and another 100% uh, say for the next two or three years you know I believe that 103% is sandbagged here because analysts right now I mean the analysts are, are sandbagging right now they are sandbagging for indie just like they are sandbagging for every single other company right that, that, this is a company that saw acceleration of its sales in 2022, if you remember, the, the whole recession market madness really started to spread if, in November of 2021. That's really when it started to spread, when this whole companies need to stop spending conversation, that started in November of 2021. This is a company who, for the full year of 2022, grew 129%. So 2022 had bad macro, and this company grew 129%. That has to do with their field, right? Legacy Auto has no choice but to invest, over-invest, over-invest to catch up to Tesla because Tesla is eating their lunch. So they have no choice. They're investing very, very heavily. And in my view, Indy seems to be a beneficiary. So I'm very bullish on Indy. Um, I will be start. I will be starting a position as as soon as soon as the opportunity presents itself. You know, we have, the problem is there's deals everywhere right now. But I will be starting a position on Indy. Indy. As soon as I saw it, seemed like a no-brainer. It seems like a no-brainer after doing my full analysis today. Spent a lot of time studying it. It's it's a good fit for me because you know if you if you if you believe in, in electric vehicles, okay. If you believe there's going to be a revolution. If in electric vehicles, a disruption. If you believe Legacy Auto is is having to invest and is investing heavily, heavily, heavily in 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 trying to catch up with Tesla, and if you believe that even if Legacy Auto fails, they're gonna get bailed out, which is what I believe. They've got, they've gotten bailed out once in the U.S. Right? GM Ford. They got bailed out once. Not Ford didn't need a bailout, but that's you see what I mean. Um, they, they they got an an injection, a cash injection from the government once. Like who who's 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 here not to tell me that say in 2027, 2028, when these companies struggle, because I don't know a lot of these Ford Raptors and over ninety thousand dollar trucks get repoed. Who's to tell me Ford or GM is not going to get bailed out? You know, I, I, I believe they will never let the legacy auto go away. And so what that means for Indy is that the, the business is really, is really I, I, think, I think, going to thrive. Um, at least that's my, that, that's my view. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm putting my money where my mouth is here. So I'm, I'm going to be buying the stock this week. Uh, and and I, I like the valuation very, very much as well as the potential. Keep in mind, this is the highest growth in all of my universe. So this was not investment advice. This is just entertainment and edutainment. I appreciate all of your likes. Please subscribe. You can also follow me on Twitter. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.